Let's get to Arsenal, they're out. Benton this defeat in Munich. Do you think it's a fair result over the two legs? What's your take? Yes, I do, particularly tonight. I think the first half tonight, it was cagey, it was even. Second half was all buy-in. And once Bayern scored the goal, they had a couple of opportunities to go two or three up, and then they defended really well. I was saying during the game, this was earmarked as Harry Kane, former Spurs player, to knock Arsenal out. But it was Eric Dier, the former Spurs player, that was the best of the two. I thought he defended extremely well all game with Delict. It didn't really allow Arsenal any opportunity. They limited them to half chances, really, and they brought on Trossard and Jesus and Keita at the end, but they just couldn't create anything. And overall, you'd say, yeah, the experience of Bayern paid off. What will Arsenal think when they reflect on it? Do you think they'll feel they perhaps could have done more, particularly in that first half, come out stronger? Yeah, I think so. I think I said before the game that in the knockout stages, they have looked a little bit inexperienced. Understandable, it's 14 years, I think, since they were last in the quarterfinals and the knockout stages. Buy-in, they're used to that. Although buy-in, I think they've been out at the quarterfinal stage the last three campaigns, so they'll be pleased to get through that. But yeah, I think Arsenal could have done a little bit more, but as I said, it was so difficult because they defended particularly well buy-in in front of the home crowd. It has to be said, the Arsenal supporters were in good voice as well. It was said 3,700 of them went out to Germany and they were in good voice, so they'll be disappointed traveling home, but Bayern just done what they do. That's two massive losses in four days for Arsenal, isn't it? What now for their season, traveling to Wolves at the weekend? Well, they have to try and stay with Manchester City. We know that they're drawing tonight and the extra time's not going to help them particularly, but they're a winning machine, Manchester City, so Arsenal need to stay with them somehow. That's two massive losses in four days for Arsenal, isn't it? What now for their season, traveling to Wolves at the weekend? Well, they have to try and stay with Manchester City. We know that they're drawing tonight and the extra time's not going to help them particularly, but they're a winning machine, Manchester City, so Arsenal need to stay with them somehow. Starting with Wolves, get over the disappointment of the two defeats, Villa and tonight against Bayern, and just see if Manchester City slip up. They'll be there to go ahead in the Premier League, but if they don't, however good it has been this season, it's still going to be disappointing to walk away with nothing at the end of the season. As a former player at this point, do you feel the momentum's against you? How difficult is it to rise again at this point, or is that down in part to the manager to gee them up again? Yeah, of course it is. The buck stops with the manager, we know that, and he has to make them forget about the last two results. Tonight in particular was disappointing because buy-in, were there for the taking, I feel. I do feel whoever goes through tonight of Man City and Real Madrid, I think they'll beat Bayern. I could be wrong, but I didn't think they offered a lot. They've done enough just to beat Arsenal. So as momentum goes, the senior players as well need to get together as a group and say, let's keep our season on track. See if we can just stay with Manchester City, Liverpool, whoever is going to be winning the games and try and end the season with something, some kind of momentum. Uh, because you don't want it to fizzle out like last season and keep that reputation that they bottled at the end of the season because I think that's particularly hard. In some courts, it probably seems like kicking a team when they're down but there's been a big debate, hasn't there, with Arsenal laughed off about not having a number 9. When it's games like this though, do you feel that perhaps a goal poacher, someone that's instinctive, could have helped them? Yes, I was a little bit surprised to see Jesus on the bench, whether that was a fitness issue or tiredness. We don't know. We'll hear from Michael Arteta because he can offer you something a little bit different. They played Havertz up front, Martinelli left, Saka right. Martinelli was really good. Out of the three of them, he was the better player and he got taken off for Trossard. So that was disappointing. Saka couldn't really get into the game. Would you go into transfer market though? Ivan Tony potentially? They have to. They have to. Ivan Tony, whether he's available. Isak, if he's available, I'm sure Newcastle will have something to say about that. As will Brentford. The obvious choice looks to be Ivan Tony because we know he's an Arsenal supporter, but other clubs will be in for him as well. But they need a focal point because Jesus isn't an out and out goalscorer, and Kitia isn't that player that's going to get you to title challenges for me. These three here that we've pulled out for you are probably the most informed, wide attacking players, certainly of an English bent in the Premier League right now. Arguably three of the best players in the Premier League right now, and we've been comparing the stats. 
Here's Cole Palmer, look, more goals, considerably more goals, six more goals than Bukayo Saka and Phil Foden. If you look at, excuse me, if I move out the way, assists pretty even, 987. Then you look at chances created, look at Bukayo Saka in the middle, 74, way ahead of the others, surprised me a little bit, but that shows the impact he's been having for Arsenal. Passing accuracy, Phil Foden's ahead in that one, 89%. We know the way he and Manchester City like to play football, he's absolutely key for them. Possession one in the final third, Bakayo Saka, top of the list, 33 times he's won the ball back in attacking positions. So if you've got to pick one of those three or two of those three to play in wide attacking positions, which do you go for? Which of those characteristics are most important? So yes, there's no doubt that Cole Palmer is absolutely outstanding, but there's a bit of flavor of the month here, I think you have to say. There's a bit of day after scoring four goals. I was talking to you a few weeks ago about Phil Foden who just scored a hat trick in the number 10 position. Everybody was saying he's got to play number 10 for England. What do you do with Jude Bellingham who's been outstanding 22 goals and 13 assists for Real Madrid this season in the number 10 position? England are blessed in these attacking positions, it's difficult to get them all in. There's no doubt Cole Palmer is absolutely on fire, there's no doubt he's going to the Euros if he stays fit. If he gets in the starting 11, that's more nuanced, I think it depends on where England are in terms of opposition and what Southgate wants to try and do with them. Alright, let's try and get him into that first 11, let's have a look at how it's possible. So talk me through it, it's not easy, it's not easy. What we've done is we've created three scenarios for you here where we try and get Cole Palmer into the England starting 11 and there are sacrifices, there are pros and cons of doing so all the time. This is the first option, look, Cole Palmer playing in a number 10 role, which means Jude Bellingham has to drop to a number 8, a little bit deeper. And as I said to you, if you look at the stats for Bellingham this season, 25 goals and 13 assists there in all competition from Real Madrid. How much attacking ability and prowess are you losing if you drop Bellingham a bit further back to get Cole Palmer in? The other negative, of course, is that Cole Palmer hasn't really been playing in a number 10 role for Chelsea this season. He's been typically playing on the right, so you're playing him out of position. And how will he fit there? He's a great footballer, but at that level, international football, will it work? One option, pros and cons. Let's show you option number two. Again, what we've done here, the only difference from that previous one is we've swapped Phil Foden and Cole Palmer over. So Foden's playing in that number 10 role where people have been clowering for him to play, where he's done so well for Manchester City this season. Cole Palmer's playing in a wide attacking position. Oh hang on, he's on the wrong side. Now, you could see a scenario where Saka and Palmer were swapping wings in the game, creating more difficulty for defending teams. Well, quite well. But again, you've lost Jude Bellingham's attacking prowess and all the goals he scored and created from a number 10 position. Pros and cons there. Maybe that one's a bit better. Let's show you the third option. I don't see this one happening, but I think it uses a really good example to show the significance of the difficulty Southgate's got. Cole Palmer in his preferred position on the right wing. So no Bukayo Saka. Can you drop Bukayo Saka with those stats we've just shown you? He's been outstanding for Arsenal this season. He's been brilliant for England for two or three tournaments now. So none of these are palatable. And I think what it shows you is just the problems that England have got and Southgate's got in trying to accommodate a world-class set of attacking options and midfield options. We've got Rice and Gallagher there. The advantage of this one is you can get an extra midfielder. It might be Gallagher, might be Kabi Minu in there, but you haven't got Bukayo Saka, which is a hell of a loss. We haven't even talked about defense. I think you and I'll talk a lot more about defense in the weeks and months to come when we know who's fit. This is where England are weak, whether they're full strength or not. This area is where they're incredibly strong. And you and I are arguing about whether it's Palmer or Saka or Foden or Grealish or, you know, Jared Bowen or even Anthony Gordon, who's come into the wide attacking areas really impressively for England recently. They're really strong whichever option you go for. It's other areas where England have got problems. He doesn't get in, Bert. He doesn't get in the starting 11, does he? He doesn't though, does he? He comes off the bench and scores the winner. He doesn't get in the starting 11. Good feeling. I think that's probably right. I think that's what Southgate will do. We talk a lot about Gareth Southgate sticking with his favorites, sticking with the players that have been there at big tournaments and have the experience. That's not Cole Palmer, but he's a match winner. He's a game changer. I think you're probably right. He's an option from the bench, but even there, it's not straightforward, is it? No, it absolutely isn't. Do you know what? That's our view, but we want you to get involved, digest it.
we're running a WhatsApp poll. Question simply is, is Palmer the best player in the Premier League on current form? Exciting times in the Premier League as the battle nears the finish line. Let's take it up from here, shall we? We all know what happened to Unai Emery when he went to Arsenal. Was that kind of like one in the eye for him? He basically delivered a tactical masterclass to Arteta, didn't he? He did, and I was speaking to Emi Martinez at the beginning of the season, and he told me, he said, he's a tactical genius. He really did. I don't know why, sometimes managers, players alike, it doesn't happen for them at the club that they go to. Because Unai Emery, everywhere he's been, has been great. Maybe Arsenal could have kept him for a little bit longer, who knows. I mean, Arsenal have a tremendous manager now in Arteta that's really built the club up. And it looks like Unai Emery's found a home, and from my Villa days, I'm very happy he's there. You wouldn't want to hear any rumours or anything about him leaving, particularly if Eric Ten Hag potentially goes in summer. Might he be interested in a club like Manchester United if he was offered? I don't know him personally, so I don't know if he would be interested personally in something like that. But I would think any big job that comes open, he will be one of the names on the list. I would agree with that. Let's talk about Arsenal then. How important does that game against Bayern Munich now look in terms of their season? They have to get the victory, don't they? They do. They really do. Losing at home to Villa, having Manchester City leapfrog them, that's a mental blow and they're going to have to recover quickly against Bayern Munich. Bayern Munich have just lost the Bundesliga by a landslide, which is unheard of. So Bayern Munich themselves have to go and try to lift the trophy this season because they've missed out. And I know it's well documented in the UK because Harry Kane's there um, that they need to go and try to lift the trophy. So they're going to put everything into this game. This will be a hard game, but yes, mentally going into the last games of the Premier League season, they need to get back on track and back on track quickly because your confidence can quickly zap out of you when Man City keeps winning. Yeah, we'll talk about them right now, really, but in terms of Arsenal, I went to the club on Friday and it felt like there was a real positivity in the camp. I spoke to Leandro Trosser and he said, you know, I feel we can win every single game now. The fact that they haven't, the fact that they've lost one, and we know what happened last season, do you think that could really kind of, I don't know, put them off course, shall we say? Well, I fully understand why they would have been full of confidence. They should have been. They played a very good first half, even a chance Saka cut in, and he missed just narrowly to Martinez's right-hand side. I mean, this will be a blow, and yes, memories of last season could creep in. So, the next game against Wolves, it's good that another game comes straight away, so they can get back on the field, and if they win it, um, then you can see the confidence come back in and they can go on another run and hopefully at least make us wait until the last kick of the game on the last day of the season on who the champion's going to be which is what we all want, particularly as neutrals. Some of us, some of us, some of us not so neutral, might I say. Look, Manchester City, you mentioned they are horrible, aren't they, to play against because they just know how to do it. This juggernaut that they do every single season, they're like a horse, aren't they? They come good at the last hurdle. You may say horrible, but they are wonderful to watch. They are, they are. If you're a football purist, I mean, even if I grew up a Man UTD supporter, which I did not, you would have to respect what they do. De Bruyne comes out, Foden comes in and controls the game. If both of them are on the field, they're virtually unstoppable going forward. Kyle Walker gets injured and there's a replacement for him. Rodri says he's tired, there's a replacement for him. Dedison, one of the finest goalkeepers around, is out and they bring in Ortega and he's doing a great job. They just have a great squad. The man management, when you have all these players that are very good, that's not an easy thing to do. I know people can talk about Pep's tactics and Pep's this and Pep's that. Keeping those players, you're not going to keep them all happy, that's for sure, but keeping them all focused and to the level that they can play is a remarkable thing to do. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? We almost take for granted what they've done. This double treble is still on. If you step back a bit, just in case anyone couldn't see the run-in, how do you see it playing out? Let's talk about City. Do you see them losing any of these games? You look at Tottenham, they don't have a great record against Tottenham especially out away from home. They were woeful at the weekend. High possession team, they play a high line, they do concede a lot of chances. It looks like the easiest run in for all three, but the one I look at is that one. I think Pep Guardiola will be looking at that one. You see Chelsea will be a hard game, Tottenham's going to be a hard game, Man United's going to be a hard game. Depending on what happens with Everton, that could be a really difficult game in the last game of the season. You look at a Merseyside Derby, it's going to be difficult. 
Tottenham's going to be difficult, West Ham's not easy. Aston Villa is a very good team. This is a tough run in. They have the easiest on paper, but the Premier League's not on paper. Some surprises can happen and creep up. You mentioned your team there, they're involved in the run in. Are they going to get? It may go down to five places now in terms of the Champions League, but you'd put Aston Villa in the role to get the Champions League. After this weekend, sure, but a couple of weeks ago, maybe 10 days ago, it was Tottenham's advantage. Then they go and they lose 4-0, and Aston Villa have an incredible result at Arsenal. That can switch again next week. These teams are all very, very good. Ange Pasikoglu is going to play the same way. They usually create enough chances, and if they score at the right time, then they can get their result. But they do, of all the teams at the top, they concede the most chances. They're also so fun to watch. They really are. Maybe some supporters would like it to be a little bit more tight at the back. Maybe not, because they also had the years where they were playing very defensively. But these games are so fun to watch now. It, if you look at the way Man City plays, the way Arsenal plays, the way Villa plays, the way Tottenham plays, the way Liverpool plays, it's all attacking. It's all high pressing. It may go down to five places now in terms of the Champions League, but you'd put Aston Villa in the role to get the Champions League. After this weekend, sure, but a couple of weeks ago, maybe 10 days ago, it was Tottenham's advantage. Then they go and they lose 4-0, and Aston Villa have an incredible result at Arsenal. That can switch again next week. These teams are all very, very good. Ange Pasikoglu is going to play the same way. They usually create enough chances, and if they score at the right time, then they can get their result. But they do, of all the teams at the top, they concede the most chances. They're also so fun to watch. They really are. Maybe some supporters would like it to be a little bit more tight at the back. Maybe not, because they also had the years where they were playing very defensively. But these games are so fun to watch now. It, if you look at the way Man City plays, the way Arsenal plays, the way Villa plays, the way Tottenham plays, the way Liverpool plays, it's all attacking. It's all high pressing. It's really, really fun to watch. Get this title race going. Carl, you're shooting it down. You're saying Arsenal are going to be exhausted. Parker, help me here. Talk us through what's left for these three teams vying for the title. I'm not sure I can help you, but for all those fans of all those teams that are watching this so closely, let's have a look at the games left. I bet most fans when they go to bed can see all these fixtures in their minds anyway. It starts tonight, doesn't it, for Arsenal? Huge victory psychologically against Wolves after a horrible week for them. Can they build on that at home tonight? I think as soon as people realise that Arsenal were there in this run-in, that is the game away at Tottenham, where many of the Arsenal fans have a little bit of fear around that fixture. At home against Bournemouth, away at Manchester United and we've spoken about the Everton one in the last few weeks. We don't know what's going to be riding on that. Maybe Everton will be safe by then, but that could prove to be huge. In terms of Liverpool, well, it's a nice tasty derby for them to get them up and running in these final sets of fixtures. Tottenham again have a say, don't they? In all three of these teams and Villa we know how good they can be with Wolves on the final day and Manchester City still to play. Tottenham away, the hoodoo around Pep sort of disappeared slightly in that FA Cup game, but it's still not necessarily a happy hunting ground for Manchester City, and then there are other teams with maybe slightly less to play for, Forest aside, in those final few fixtures. We've been talking about who's the easiest, who's got the best or the worst, and then we have a Sunday like we did the other week with Villa and Crystal Palace winning, so who are we to predict anything? Certainly not me, because I'm looking at that and I'm thinking for Arsenal, I'm thinking Bournemouth have found a bit of form from somewhere. Manchester United will certainly want to go out Old Trafford on a high note and Everton, who knows what they'll be playing for on the final day of the season, but it's the next two, is it? Particularly Sunday, you would think Chelsea hot and cold, although they do turn it on perhaps against the teams in the top six. It's the teams in the bottom six that have been their Achilles heel, isn't it? Yeah, it has. I mean, looking at that week that Arsenal have got coming up, I think Spurs is the really big one. They've not got a great record at Tottenham. They actually won there last season, but that was the first time they'd won there in the league since 2014. And obviously Spurs have their own issues to fight for. They're trying to get into the top four. They absolutely do not want to aid Arsenal's title charge. Then as you say Rob Chelsea, I mean who knows what Chelsea side are going to turn up. They've been really good on occasion against top six sides this season, should have beaten Arsenal at Stamford Bridge earlier in the year, they kind of threw it away in the last 15 minutes. Obviously we're going to talk about Chelsea a little bit without Cole Palmer perhaps so, and even if Cole Palmer was playing, Arsenal are a better team, they should take care of business at home to Chelsea but that Spurs game is absolutely huge. 
It's massive, isn't it? These are two huge, huge games for Arsenal. I think one advantage they maybe do have though in this running compared to Man City and Liverpool is that three of their remaining five games are at home. You know you look at Liverpool's fixtures, they've got only two of their five at home and Man City actually only have two of their remaining six at home. So if Arsenal can use that home advantage to their benefit, then that could be something that helps them. And on top of that, you look at their away form and the fact they've kept six consecutive clean sheets on the road. So there are positive signs there for Arsenal. There are signs that they can maybe get over the line, but of course Chelsea first and then Spurs. And they are just absolutely crucial games and you just cannot afford to slip up at this stage of the season. So they'll need to win if they can really capitalize on that little home advantage that they have in those remaining fixtures. Gary, Arsenal are top, but that doesn't really tell the story of the season, does it? No, and Arsenal fans would point to last year when they were top for more days than anyone else and it was City that still won the title. You've got to be top when it really matters. And people may be a little bit surprised to see City where they are. They started the season with the six straight wins, and then they had that little wobble with Newcastle and with the Wolves game. Uh, Liverpool top more days than anyone else and it feels like Arsenal have been top of the league quite a lot this season, doesn't it? I think the leads changed nearly 20 times, Arsenal with 56, Tottenham obviously that bright start at the beginning of the first few weeks and until the game against Chelsea when things began to unravel a little bit, and what I would say about this, this is days at the top, and when we've had a few international breaks that maybe skews it slightly, Arsenal of course on that sort of 10 match run off the back of their winter break and their sunshine, so that sort of skews it because Liverpool and Man City had that draw and so Arsenal went top, and then we had sort of two week breaks. So take those figures with a little bit of a pinch of salt, but I don't know, we're looking at any clues, aren't we, as to where the Premier League might end up? Oh yeah, well, I'm looking at West Ham two days at the top there. Absolutely be dining out on that. Dining out from that forever. Top of the league two days. I'm trying to think when that, uh, that would have been after match day three. I think if my memory serves me correctly after a 3-1 win against Brighton, I think they went top for those glorious two days. But Arsenal there for just 56 days at the top. But as Gareth was saying last season, they had the most number of days at the top. Does it really count? So what chances have Arsenal got of the title now? I think they've still got a good chance. It's funny everyone kind of wrote off the title, didn't they, after the last weekend when they and Liverpool lost. But I think they've still got a good chance. I would still put my money on Manchester City. I think their running is easier. I think the fact that they got knocked out of the Champions League, their treble chances are over. I think that will only increase their determination to win the Premier League again. You can't rule out Liverpool, but I think their running is much harder than the other two. But... They've got to play Tottenham and they've got to play Aston Villa. Uh, they just don't quite convince me as much as Arsenal or Man City. They're never quite as in control of games. They go behind a lot so Arsenal still got a chance. I would still back City but they're not out of it at all Arsenal. Uh, it's so tight isn't it? I mean I think Arsenal, I agree Arsenal do have a decent chance. Obviously they're dependent on Man City to a certain extent. But their defensive record is what probably gives fans the most hopes. The most hope I think you know it's difficult to even create chances against Arsenal let alone score them you know you look at the goals they conceded it, it's by far the lowest then you look at the expected goals against which measures the chances you know the quality of the chances they're actually giving up and again it's just way out ahead of Man City and Liverpool so that is something they have you know that is something they have in their favour they have a really strong defensive setup and that is something that could maybe get them over the line but it's hard of course given Man City's history it's hard to look past them isn't it but it's fascinating fascinatingly poised